that you guys heard, uh, uh, I don't know if you heard the news, but we, we are hosting the Super Bowl. Maybe, maybe you guys heard that. Has anybody heard about it? Well, I'm I, I, I hope that you did. I was checking about the prices yesterday. I heard the, the, the cheapest ticket right now, if you wanted to get one and sit all the way in the back, all the way up top, the cheapest is going for $10,000. Uh, if you want to be, uh, uh, be a little bit in the front, it's going for $70,000. If you want to have a suite on your own, $300,000. And the worst of it all, I heard there's a guy who bought a ticket uh, for $10,000, I guess one of those expensive tickets, and it's only after he bought the ticket he realized that's the day that he's going to get married. So he just realized that he's supposed to get married today. So he was debating, I guess they were at a barber, he was debating whether, w whether he should give away the ticket or some, send somebody else to represent him in the marriage, in the wedding. So he was debating, I don't know. Am I gonna, <laughs> am I gonna lose the game or am I gonna send somebody else? But anyway, it's, it, it's exciting. Uh, uh, it's a great day, so uh, <laughs> a, a, lot, a lot of traffic. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, traffic, there's a lot, of go, um, a lot going on, um, uh, you know, in Florida right now, especially in Miami-Dade County. Amen. Having said that, um, but that's a great introduction. In fact, that's a great introduction to the subject that we want to talk about this month. Um, you know, because, um, you know, you know um, people pay that amount of money. And if you ask people, why do you pay $10,000, $70,000, $300,000, you know, uh, um, um, to watch a game, uh, um, to watch a game, uh, you know, they will tell you that, you know, I'm going to enjoy myself. I'm going to enjoy myself. Now, what does it mean to enjoy? To enjoy means to do something that brings you joy. But... And that, of course, that brings us to the subject of this month because we are studying the fruit of the Spirit. Last month, we studied love. And today, starting this month, we are talking about joy. So, you know, it's, it's, it's really interesting because, as I said, people do that to enjoy themselves, to bring themselves joy. But comes the question, where can you find real joy in life? That's a big question. Because at the end of the day, at the end of the day, everything that we do, we do it. Um, ultimately, we do it so we can be happy in life. All of us want to have a joyful life. All of us want to enjoy our life. The Declaration of Independence, you know, uh, one of the things that is mentioned in the Declaration of Independence or what... Uh, uh, propel um, the American independence basically from England and propel the Revolutionary War in the United States between 1775 to 1783 was that um, they wrote that everyone has an uh, inalienable right. They have a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So one of the things that we fought for as a nation, the United States of America as a nation fought for for eight years is the freedom to pursue happiness the way that we want to, the pursuit of happiness. Uh, but comes the question, so it's important for us, but comes the question, where can we find true happiness? This is not a question that people are asking themselves today. Man has been asking himself that question for thousands and thousands of years. And one of the people in history who asked himself that question was a man by the name of Solomon. Solomon was a pretty interesting figure. Pretty interesting figure because he came to power. God, he, God knows that men would always be looking for joy and we would look for joy in different places so god allowed a young man to come to power at a very young age and gave him everything that somebody could imagine 
could possibly bring a person joy in life and allowed Solomon to experience that. And then Solomon, Solomon lived all of these things for 40 years. Um, historians believe that Solomon came to power when he was around 20 years old. And they believe that he wrote the book of Ecclesiastes when he was 60 years old. So he had about 40 years to enjoy different aspects of life and actually give us a, a report of, of what did he find out enjoying those different things. And after Solomon enjoyed different things in life for 40 years, he wrote a book almost at the end of his life called the book of Ecclesiastes and he begins the book with those astonishing words. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. The word vanity is a Hebrew word, havel in Hebrew. It means breath. You see breath, when you breathe on somebody, the person feels it for a second and then it's gone. So the word used for vanity in the Bible means breath. You feel it for a second and then it totally disappears. Then Solomon says, the joy that the different things in this world can offer, they are like, they are like the impact of a breath. You feel it for a second and it disappears. Now, you might wonder, why should I take Solomon seriously? You should take Solomon seriously because no man who's ever lived in this planet or who will ever live has ever had the experience of Solomon in different areas of life. Therefore, he was more than qualified to talk to us about life. Let me first begin. And a lot of the things that I'm going to tell you, of course, they are in my book. I encourage you guys to get the book the fruit of the spirit it's a devotional and there's a reason why we do the devotional when I teach on Sunday morning all the messages that I teach on Sunday morning I put them in a book I, so it means not only that you hear me teach but during the week we also give you homework we also give you homework Monday Tuesday Wednesday Thursday Friday etc when you hear the message on Sunday you are able to go through the devotional and you can apply the word in your life. Why do we put so much work into this? And it's not just me writing the book. We have an entire team in the church. We work together. We come together to write those books for you. Why? Because Jesus says, whoever hears my word and practices it and does not practice it, it's like a man who's built his, a castle on the sand. He says, as soon as the wind comes, he said, the wind blows the castle and it falls on the floor. But he says, he who hears my word and practices my word, his life is like a castle that is built on the rock. And then he says, when the wind comes, the rock still remains. Why? Because the life is built on the rock. Jesus says, when you hear my word on Sunday morning and you practice it, your life becomes like a castle built on a rock. So that's why at the church, in order to help you to do that, we write devotionals for you, we give you homework, so everybody, when you hear the message on Sunday, we give you homework every day, this is what you do Monday, this is what you do Tuesday, this is what you do Wednesday. We encourage everybody at the church in every ministry, we say everybody should have their time of prayer every morning. And we encourage everybody in ministry to not only do your devotional, but also post your devotional in the different WhatsApp church, WhatsApp chats we have in the church. Why do we do all of that? Because we don't want you to come on Sunday morning and just hear the word. We want you to practice the word because when you practice the word, your life will be transformed. Hallelujah. So that's the purpose of doing all of that. But having said that, Solomon... Uh, uh, so I'm not going to give you all the reference because you're going to read it in your devotional this week. But Solomon was, uh, was a man, extraordinary, was an extraordinary celebrity. He enjoyed everything. One of the things that he enjoyed is that he was a world celebrity. 
So some people try to be happy by becoming a celebrity. We look at people who are celebrities in the world. Um, we said, wow, if only um, I could be like Beyonce. If only I could be like Michael Douglas. If only I could be like, uh, you know, LeBron James. If only, et cetera, et cetera. We look at celebrity, and some people think if they become a celebrity, it'll bring them joy in life. But I'll tell you this, one of the greatest celebrity that you had, you had in, uh, uh, Solomon was one of the greatest celebrity of his time. First Kings chapter 10 says, the queen of Sheba, the queen of Sheba, the fence, the fence of Solomon at his time, in his time, it wasn't just the masses, it wasn't just the regular people, it was kings and queens of the earth who were actually fans of Solomon. The Bible says one person who came from afar to see Solomon was a woman by the name of Sheba. She was a queen of Ethiopia, almost like, almost South Africa. Okay, so she came all the way a little bit from uh, uh, south, close to South Africa, and she went all the way north, North Africa, and went all the way north, continued north to Israel, and she came to Solomon. She said, Solomon, when I was in my country, I had heard of you. I had heard of your power. I had heard of your wealth. I had heard of your wisdom. When I started hearing about your wealth, your power, your, your wisdom, I told the people they were lying. It's not true. It's impossible for somebody to be so smart. It's impossible for somebody to be that wise. It's impossible for somebody to be that powerful. It's not true. So in order to, in order to, 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 uh, to contradict their testimony, in order to come against their testimony, she herself took her chariot and, and drove to the kingdom of Israel to see for herself. So she can actually show, uh, so she can contradict the reports that she had received. She said, she told Solomon, when I had heard of you, I didn't want to believe you. But she said, when I come into your kingdom, I see your house. I see your servant. I see your people. I see the economy. I, I, he, I ask you questions and hear of your wisdom. She said, when I heard about you, I didn't want to believe it. But when I came and saw for myself, I realized half of your glory was not told to me. Half of your glory was not told to me. Solomon was a major celebrity. People came from all around the world to hear Solomon speak. After enjoying all of that celebrity for 40 years, Solomon said, vanity of vanity, all is vanity. In other words, these things cannot bring true joy, true happiness, true satisfaction in life. Not only Solomon was a celebrity, but Solomon was the richest person in the world. At his time, he was the richest person. Look at, there's a, a few verses in the Bible talks about Solomon's wealth, just so you can have an idea. Let me see if I can find that verse. Um, in 1 Kings, find me 1 Kings chapter 10. 1 Kings chapter 10, uh, verse 26. 1 Kings chapter 10, Verse 26 talks, I mean, when you have time, go home um, today and read the entire chapter. But I just want you to see that. Let's read together. It says, Solomon gathered chariots and horsemen. He had one, he had 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horsemen whom he stationed in the chariot cities. And with that, uh, and, and with the king at whatever, at Jerusalem. Okay. Huh. Let, let me explain. Let me explain this to you because that was 1,000 years ago. Let me bring you in today's world. 3,000 years later, let me bring you in today's world so you can understand. In the time of Solomon, if you were poor, you would, you would take bus 11. You know what's bus 11? All right. When I was in Brooklyn, New York, when you walk by foot, they said you took bus 11. 
One and one, one and one. So you kind of go like this. <laughs> That's bus 11. Okay. If you were poor, you took bus 11. In the time of Solomon. If you were rich, not, not if you were rich, if you were middle class, you had a, you know, you had a good income. No, no, I mean, if you were middle class, I mean, you had a comfortable life, you would have had a donkey. If you were poor, you walked. If you were middle class, you had a donkey. If you were an upper class, if you were upper class, you would have a horse. So, for example, politicians had horses. Alexander the Great had a horse. Pharaoh had a horse. Different people who were in power and authority, generals, had horses. So, if you were upper class, you know, you would have a horse. If you were the economic elite, you were rich, you were extremely rich, you were a king, then you would have a chariot. So if you had a chariot, you were, you were part of the 1%. The very rich of the, that society was able to afford a chariot. So in today's world, let me see. Well, let me come. In today's world, well, bus 11 would still be bus 11, okay? So if you can afford, you know, so, so, so walking would still be walking. But the donkey, donkey in today's world, it would be compared to perhaps, huh? Huh? A, a, a regular car, whatever you want to call it. You want to call it a Toyota Camry, you want to call it a Honda, whatever. It's a regular car. You would have a regular car. Um, if you are an upper class, you would have a horse. Now we're talking about a Mercedes, we're talking about a BMW, we're talking about a Range Rover, etc. We're talking about a car, $80,000, $90,000, etc., etc. If you are extremely rich, then you would have a chariot. A chariot would be compared to a Rolls Royce. When you talk about Rolls Royce, we're talking about $250,000 and up. You're talking about Lamborghini, you're talking about Ferrari, you're talking about those cars that are $250,000 and up. So I give you that just to give you, you know, the comparison so you can understand. So what a chariot would be equivalent today. So, so, so a donkey would be a regular car, uh, um, a horse would be an upper uh, class car, and then, um, you, you know, um, a chariot would be, you know, really a, a luxurious, really luxurious car. Now... Think about this. Solomon, the Bible said, he had 1,400 chariots. You know in today's world what that would have meant? That would have meant that Solomon would have had 1,400 Rolls Royce. Rolls Royce or Ferrari or Lamborghini parked in front of his car. In front of his house. And then he said he had 12,000 horsemen stationed, um, you know, in, in different places. 12,000 horsemen, it means basically to have 12,000 horsemen, you need to have 12,000 horse. So he had 12,000, 1,400 chariots, 12,000 horses. 12,000 horses would be like 12,000 Mercedes, Cadillac, BMW, etc., all of them 12,000. Now, in order to park all of that, you would note, if in order to park all of that, put up the verse, you will see to park all of that, the Bible said he had to station them in chariot cities. So he had to build cities for his parking lot. Because when you're talking about 12,000 vehicles, 104,000, those are precious assets. You need security. You need people to clean them. You need people to keep them in shape. You have to have an entire city working to maintain. So you start to understand the wealth of Solomon. Nobody in the world right now comes close to that. Are you guys starting to understand? Solomon... Solomon, the Bible says, when you read the chapter, the Bible says in Solomon's house, he did not use glass. He did not use porcelain. He did not use any of the things. With, he did not use silver. Everything in his house, from the spoon 
to the, um, to the knife, and to the fork, to the cup, to the plate, to the chair that he sat. Everything was made, the Bible says, in pure gold. Pure gold. <laughs> Amazing. One historian talks about the temple that Solomon had built, the temple of Solomon. And I remember I read that years ago. It must have been uh, about 25 years ago. They had, you know, calculated what would be the cost of Solomon's temple, the te temple that he had built, uh, you know, for today. You know, it had amounted to $4 trillion. Now, think about that for a moment. Without counting his personal palace, et cetera, et cetera, uh, you know, all those horses, etc. Just the temple, it was $4 trillion. Now, in this economy right now, re even in this world right now, in this world right now, you do not have one trillionaire. We have, we have one company that is worth a trillion dollars. It's Apple. But you don't, have, you don't have a person who's a trillionaire. Of course, our richest person right now is uh, Jeff Bezos, the owner of Amazon. Last time I checked, I think it was 120 billion or something like that. But I don't know we, after the divorce with his wife, you know what's his net worth right now. But <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how that worked out. But think about it. Think about it. Think about it. A hundred billion dollars. A hundred billion dollars is is 10 percent of one trillion is 10% of 1 trillion. So, uh, so right now, right, just the temple that Solomon had, had built was 40 times the whole net worth of Jeff Bezos. Just the temple without counting everything else that he owned. So in other words, Jeff Bezos could have worked as a butler for Solomon. Amazing. So Solomon enjoyed all of that, and Solomon enjoyed. When you read the Bible, you'd be amazing. I, mean, I, I won't have time because I don't have time to get into this, but I could have showed you in the Bible, Solomon was in the gold business. He was in the shipping business. He was in the car business. He had um, speaking, um, he was in motivational speaking business. He had all kinds of businesses around the world, extremely rich. He enjoyed all of that for 40 years. And then you know what he said after enjoying all of that for 40 years? Vanity, all vanity, all, all those cars, all those chariots, all those, vanity, all vanity, all is vanity. In other words, I look for joy in wealth, money, even with that vast amount of wealth, it still could not bring me true joy and true happiness in life. And then some people said, I don't care about celebrity. I don't care about, about, about money. I mean, you know, you know I, just, I just, you know, if you, get, if you get me a decent babe, a nice girl, good-looking girl, I'll be set, Pastor Greg. <laughs> I'll tell you, Solomon, the Bible said, had 700 wives. So not, not, not just 700 wives. The Bible says, let me see if I can pick up that verse. It's not only because, you know, Pastor Greg is making that up. I want to make sure. Uh, uh, you know, it's not just uh, seven. Look at 1 Kings, um, 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 3. 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 3. Find me that verse real quick. Let's read together. Is that it? Okay, let's read together. He said, he had 700 wives, comma. And then, and then, come on. And then he explains what he means by 700 wives. 700 princesses. So, so we're, not, we're not talking about, we're not talking somebody who are growing up in the ghetto right there, you know. It's, it's not ghetto girls, my friend. It's, not, it's, it's 700. It's 700 princesses. They had to be part of the upper echelon of society. 700 of them. And then as if that were not enough in 300 concubine means <laughs> side chicks. <laughs> Those who are not on the official record. 
On top of that, he had 500, 300 girlfriends. So that's a thousand women. So it means that if, that, if, it means if Solomon was spending one night with each wife without celebrating Christmas or Thanksgiving or taking any holidays, it would take Solomon two years and a half to see the same person again. <laughs> That's with no holidays, I told you. No holidays. <laughs> no way. And after Solomon enjoyed all of that, what did he say? Vanity of vanity. All is vanity. At the end of his book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon gives us the conclusion. Let's read Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Verse 13. So Solomon took 12 chapters of his book called Ecclesiastes to tell us how he searched for joy everywhere and he couldn't find it. Money, knowledge, pleasure, celebrity, food, youth, etc. He couldn't find it. In the last chapter of the book, he said, I have told you that I search for joy, satisfaction, happiness, contentment everywhere in life. I couldn't find it. He says, now we at the end of the book. In the last two verses, let's read together. He says, now let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Because I told you where you cannot find joy. Let me tell you now where you can find joy. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. And he said, let's read together. What he says? He said, fear God and keep his commandments. For this is men's all. This is men's all. This is men's all. This is men's essence. This is the main point. If you miss it, you miss everything else. You can have money like I had money. You can have pleasure like I had pleasure. You can have women like I had women. You can have knowledge like I had knowledge. If you miss this, you've missed it all. You've missed it all. If you miss this, you've missed it all. You've missed it. Oh. Because the only true source of happiness, contentment, satisfaction in this life and the life to come is the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why some of the wealthiest people are some of the most miserable people. Because you can have all the money if you don't have Jesus, you've missed it all. You've missed it all. You've missed it all. Yeah. You can have all the knowledge in the world. You could go to school, get yourself a bachelor's, a master's, a PhD. Praise God, I'm all for education. Oh, but education cannot bring you true joy. Solomon was the wisest man on earth. But he says knowledge could not do it. Sigmund Freud was one of the greatest intellectuals of the 19th century. He impacted the 20th century. He impacted, he's one of the most dominant figures in psychology, in philosophy, in religion. Sigmund Freud, we study him in school, we study him in the universities, one of the pillars of psychology. But with all of his knowledge, Sigmund Freud was a cocaine addict. They said this man snorted cocaine like a horse. With all the knowledge that Sigmund Freud had, there was something he could not find in the books. There was a satisfaction that his masters and PhDs and doctorate and knowledge and recognition and chairs at the university couldn't give him. Solomon said, after enjoying all of these things in life, I've come to the conclusion. Hmm. Let us see the conclusion of the whole thing. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. I pray that will be your all today. In the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus. Shekinah app. 
télécharger le Kounia.